humans have this overwhelming need to tell everybody what's on their mind. So it's a really, really exciting time to be in linguistics. Because so if you study differences between, say, English and Japanese, um, you know, you find striking generalizations that you can make. But once you start studying very closely related languages, um, a much richer picture emerges. So that makes, you, makes it easier for you to focus on a specific aspect of a language and then try to come up with the supposed to be the truth or whatever theory you have about what that specific phenomenon. Well, if you put two people in a room and they have no language, then what would happen? Uh, kind of traditional generative, structural, you know, tree drawing uh, approach to sentence structure. You know, it was thought for, for a long time that that just didn't apply to a language like Russian. And what I'm actually involved in trying to show is that despite these apparent differences, that things are much more similar than you would think. John seems to attend every party. John tries to attend every party. They look so similar. And then you start uh, start poking at them with, with expletives and, and um, paraphrase relations and, and um, idiom chunks. And they just... <clears throat> split and they diverge. Phonetics as part of linguistics is about the knowledge you have of sounds in your language that makes you sound like a native speaker. So. Is there some sort of learning bias? Do learners come to language with some bias toward expecting certain sorts of systems? We have um, an experimental linguistics lab uh, run by John Drury in our department. Pretty much all the way up from basic low-level sound and, or visual word form processing all the way up to higher level semantic and pragmatic aspects, uh, communication and all this kind of stuff, um, have been investigated using these techniques. So um, we have people who are showing us um, uh, ERP data, right? So different parts of the cranium um, acts more with different kinds of stimuli, uh, syntactically and phonologically in all sorts of different interesting ways. Can we integrate that into the kind of theoretical models that we're using, the answer is probably yes, because we have a better understanding of the mathematical foundation of these models. So there are not a lot of people who are actually writing the grammars that allow you to turn this speech stream into a phonological representation, because it's a really hard problem. Um, but that's one of the things that we've been trying to do here. And Arabella, it, um, it, so it belongs to, to the Zapparo family. Uh, it has about 50 speakers left. It's my first OBS language. These indigenous people, they need an alphabet to begin with. So our, so our task right now is to uh, carry out a phonological analysis. If for some reason we hadn't uh, met this family with it, the, who killed the crocodile, then we, I mean, the, the next thing would have been for us to accept the invitation of the fish. Uh, and at least two of the, of the family had died because of the poison. So our fate would have been really dramatic. Yeah. There are Indians, Native Americans, um, living on Long Island who have been there, been here since uh, forever. The languages haven't been spoken for, let's say, many generations. Teaching kids to play, uh, to play Go Fish or Uno in uh, Shinnecock and so on. The department is uh, also involved in an international summer school that I co-direct in St. Petersburg, Russia, which, uh, with a strong focus in linguistics and cognitive science. By looking at how we change our pronunciation, we're seeing what we can manipulate, which then tells us what is represented in the language. As a speech language pathologist, our primary goal is to work with individuals with communication disorders. We have just begun a project here, a collaboration between um, three departments, Psychology, Linguistics, and Asian and Asian American Studies, on second language learners of English. A whole uh, sort of almost unexplored huge open terrain in phonology is perception. How their use of English, especially pronunciation, changes and presumably uh, improves over the two years that they're here. One area that is very interesting in, in uh, 
addressing that question is artificial grammar. We see that just having a pattern in the real words of the language doesn't mean that it's a pattern in the grammar that the speakers learn from those words. Giving half of them the na a language with a natural pattern to learn, the other half a language with an unnatural pattern to learn. To see, you know, are, are there differences as one learned more easily than the other? The kinds of responses we see in connection with language are also things that show up for lots of other cognitive domains. The remarkable convergence is that the very same mathematical algorithms that we use in linguistics to process spoken language, to construct representations. The very same algorithms that were developed for that um, over the last five decades are now being used by people working on protein folding. And Mark Aronoff and his group um, have been working with a, a, a sign language that uh, a new sign language has recently developed and been born, you could say, uh, in a Bedouin community in Israel. The missing link. Right, so this language is, is, it's like a missing link. It's a good time to be a linguist.